The Stormbjorn, which means Storm Bear, will be today's second creation. As I mentioned at the beginning, the Stormbjorn race was first Bjorn many years ago when I was working on the first book in my series. The character we know best is named Bargo. Bargo is a warrior who serves the great city of Seafall. He is the general of Lakestone Hold, which is a fort built in the center of a lake, and the men call him the Avalanche. Bargo is the textbook definition of stocky. Although he is a mammal, his body is covered in natural plating, just like the armadillo. On top of this natural armor, he wears steel plate, making him extremely difficult to put down. The Night Stepper has four legs, and the Venomant will have six. So here's where we'll explore the design of a biped. Ungulates, like horse and deer, walk on their tiptoes, while most mammals walk and run around on the balls of their feet. This is the case, too, with the dragons from Skyrim, or the Deathclaws from Fallout. In fact, just a few species land on their heels, bears and humans and other great apes among them. The Stormbjorn will be one of these. Its trunk will be thick, its legs short, its arms long and powerful, and its entire physique sheathed in armadillo-like plating. Despite its massive strength and stolid appearance, the characteristics that will make it unique will be largely defensive. The Stormbjorn is an herbivore, which means it eats plants, not flesh. The most important factors that will help us determine the silhouette of the Stormbjorn will be its personality and the animals from which it is derived. The Nightstepper's personality was cunning and nervous, and so the lines that composed its form were thin and sinuous to hint at both speed and a delicate nature. The Stormbjorn, on the other hand, is noble and fearless and gruff. Now, fearless is pretty easy to describe. The Night Stepper kept low and moved with care to avoid being seen. But a fearless individual doesn't hide. A fearless individual doesn't slouch or cross their arms or turn away. A fearless individual stands tall. They face us with their chest out and their arms back which is a nonverbal cue telling us they're not afraid to expose their face, their neck, their guts, and their genitals to an attack from the front. I'm not scared of you, this gesture says. I should note that if we thrust the chest out too much, we risk crossing the line from confident and fearless into aggression. Consider the Grogan, a creature I made from my plural site course entitled An Immortal Design. It too stands tall, but its body language, not to mention its face, is aggressive in the extreme. It is an alpha predator, ready to fight at the drop of a hat. Despite its brawn and natural armor, the Stormbjorn is not looking for a fight. It's older, perhaps, and protective of its own. To convey that sense of integrity, this creature will keep its head high, or as high as its stocky anatomy will allow, as a king would, to better look down upon the land and the smaller creatures around it. Later on, we might give it a thick ruff of fur or something around its neck, like that of a large cat. That might look regal. We don't yet know yet, of course, but I suppose we'll find out. When it comes to reference, we'll be looking at several animals going forward. First up will be the armadillo. I appreciate their unique blend of scales and fur, their claws, their armored faces, and their delicate pink noses. We'll study the pangolin because, well, who doesn't love pangolins? Their defining feature, of course, are their scales, so I'll be looking to see if we can do something with those. We'll look at bears, their snouts and fur, and the basic composition of their face. We'll look at gorillas, too, who live at the intersection of biped and brawn. And the final primary reference we'll draw from will be the rhinoceros. Rhinoceroses are fearless and clothed in a very particular way. Their skin hangs in folds like medieval armor, and like medieval armor, those folds are tailored just so around the limbs and joints to facilitate both protection and mobility. The Stormbjorn is as thick as a tree. The resulting silhouette is dense with little room for limb distinction. So I admit I'm having a harder than average time trying to find it. And I'm doing a lot more anatomical problem solving than I normally would at this point. We're going for a very particular look. And the operative word here is blocky. Whereas the shape language of the Night Stepper was curving and sinuous, and the venomance will be thorny and triangular, the brawny Stormbjorn's silhouette will be founded on squares. To describe that gruff, fearless, yet approachable personality, we will round out these squares at the edges, 
and thus create an element of softness. My hope is that this build will convey the solid, dependable, and immovable nature of the beast. All right, as unhappy as I am with them, I've settled on a handful of silhouettes. To be honest, I like only one of them, though I'm willing to workshop the others or somehow work them into the final. I like this one best because the weight feels most natural. The plating, while present, doesn't complicate the silhouette, and the head is held high on a very short and armored neck. That head has a narrowed aspect, sort of blunted diamond shape with close-set ears, which is an aspect I wasn't anticipating, but which I admit I quite enjoy. We'll fill in this silhouette a bit, as we did with the Nightstepper, and nudge things around to fit. So, let's take a break from the body and zoom in on the face. The Stormbjorn's facial shape should be as blocky as his body. He should look very capable of taking a hit. Now, large ears, being kind of delicate and fleshy, would be vulnerable to attack, so it's best to keep them small and tucked back. I'm enjoying the contrast, too, between the brawny shapes of his head and those dainty little ears, which are small and pointy and sort of cute. Plus, their smallness helps to emphasize his overall bigness. I like, too, how they angle inward toward each other. Paired with the armor that covers his head and face like a mask, it does remind me a bit of Batman. And who's not down with Batman? The Stormbjorn is fierce and gruff, and you certainly wouldn't want to fight him. But he's noble, too, and he should be almost approachable. So how do we convey this feeling of familiarity and non-aggression? The most obvious step will be to give him eyes that are expressive. Now, all eyes should be expressive of something, of course, but these ones should forge a greater and perhaps more personal connection with the audience. Whereas the Night Stepper stared wide-eyed and ready to bolt, the Stormbjorn should consider us. Those eyes are shadowed by his armor and fixed on ourselves. They're a bit forbidding, sure, but intimidation is perfectly welcome so long as it doesn't cross over into malevolence. His eyes are human. We'll even color them an arctic blue, and they'll be deeply nestled in thick, wizened skin, skin that's wrinkled with age and expression and experience. That flesh is soft, and that soft feeling will continue down from the eyes to the nose and mouth. Have you ever touched the muzzle of a horse? If not, you really should. And if so, try to remember now how that felt. Its coat was silky and smooth, as smooth as velvet, and the muscles underneath were heavy and warm. The noses of horses are very touchable, and that's the feeling that I'd like to convey. Strength, connection, intimidation, and a touch of warmth. This feels right. In describing the toughened exterior of the Stormbjorn, we're using the armadillo as a primary reference. And yet, if we were to copy the layout and orientation of an armadillo shell, the similarities would be overwhelming and far too obvious. We are not making an armadillo monster. We're making something new. So, in the interest of creating something new, let's experiment with larger, more molded plates, like the ones found on turtle shells, crocodiles, and on the feet of birds. I like the way that rhino skin hangs in folds over the body, but the Stormbjorn needs more than just thickened skin. It needs plating. If we went with a turtle shell, well, that would look different, and there's a few paths we could take that could help us integrate these looks. Path number one would be color. We could emulate the texture of a turtle shell, but change its color to a light brown, perhaps. Another is structure. Turtle shell has very recognizable structure and formation, like a series of hexagons, so that if we change that shape, then we make it more our own. The challenge I'm now finding with this union is that turtle shell and armadillo shell, to a lesser extent, is rigid. These shells operate as a sort of armored vehicle for the soft creature inside, and both turtles and armadillos use that vehicle to protect their arms and legs and face. But this is not ideal for the Stormbjorn. He's too large. His physical capabilities are too broad. He is, operationally speaking, a human. And humans would fare very poorly were they confined to a singular, rigid container. So we'll have to break it up. Steel armor is not composed of a single piece, but many. And if we study their formation, we might get a sense of just how and where the hardened plates can be formed without hampering movement. These steel skins force us to practically consider where we need flexibility and where we don't. The head and face of the Stormbjorn, for instance, does not need to be very flexible. 
and so we could settle on a hard, turtle-shell-like treatment for that area. But this hard, patterned aesthetic falls apart when applied to other, more flexible areas. We can't afford for this creature to look cobbled together. It should look blended and natural and cohesive. To solve this conundrum, let's think of those hardened plates not as shell, but as extremely thickened skin. Skin that grows in folds like a rhinoceros, but then thickens into plates and scales and hardened growths. An area where the skin is softer and more flexible, around the eyes for instance, those scoots will be smaller, more broken up, and more capable of movement. In areas that are inflexible, like the forearms or the thighs, the scoots will grow larger, thicker, and more tightly packed. So this sort of works. The proportions mostly work, the colors are decent, and though it's not quite there yet, the personality is beginning to come through. Best of all, we've got a more refined sense of how to integrate our various species. White fur, soft skin, and armored plating. These are the primary characteristics of the Stormbjorn, and they will carry through our entire design. Now, this portrait is far from perfect, but we're not here for perfect. We're here for inspiration. Fighting this small battle now has helped to inform us of what we can expect in the war. And that's it for the Stormbjorn. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I loved making this guy. He was a lot of fun, a lot of personality, and I enjoyed making it for personal reasons, as you saw in the video. Uh, but remember that this was just a cut down version from the full length Chimera a Creature Design Masterclass made by me, which I hope you'll enjoy. You can find the links to that in the description. If you don't watch that, or if you do, it doesn't matter. In the end, I want you to do the same thing. Please subscribe to my channel, ring the bell, I'm going places this year and I want to take you with me. We're going to be covering fantasy art, world building, tutorials, all manner of things. There is no limit, so if there's something you want to discuss with me or you want me to cover, please leave a comment down below. I will respond to it, I will be on top of it, and I really want you to be with me on this journey. So join up and let's, let's have some fun.